Okay, as long as I have um, you turned off on the computer, I can hear you. But okay, I can good. barely hear you. You're kind of weak. Now, um, I lost track of where I was going. So I was going to ask you about the, the uh, I, without starting up too much of a pot, I wanted to talk a little bit about the cruise lines and their proposed uh, inner port, because I know that that was like the, the, that would have been the death knell for the reef, um, no matter what their environmental impact statement said. Uh, so you want to talk a little bit about the cruise lines and their, their and, and what hap what's happening now with the boats going out to them and what they wanted and what that looked like? Sure. Um, the cruise lines have argued that they will not bring in their newest, largest ship to our uh, harbor because a number of reasons that are solvable with tenders. But according to the people who run the tenders here, um, they could build new tenders that would easily and perfectly and safely accommodate those big ships, anchored the way that they're anchoring now with no pier. But they, um, we continue to get the smaller ships, which in many of the arguments that were given during the debate, whether or not we needed this pier to begin with, um, many arguments said that we don't need bigger ships anyway. And we get enough cruise passengers now, and et cetera, et cetera. That's just one part of the argument. But killing the reef was the, the part that set my hair on fire, and it was clearly obvious that that was going to be the case. Um, and the people who did the EIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment, gave a presentation, a public presentation here in a large hall um, with the government officials all lined up at their desks, along with the cruise uh, officials all lined up there. And these scientists went up and, and gave us a presentation that painted a clear picture of how destructive this was going to be to the reef surrounding the dredge pit area. Immediately after that presentation, the Minister of Tourism stood up and calmly said, therefore, we're going ahead with it. And my hair literally caught on fire right then. <laughs> I, I could barely keep myself in my seat. That night I went out and I posted a change.org petition. And we got over 5,000 signatures, uh, you know, saying this is a bad idea. We don't want it. And, uh, but that alone would not have swayed the government of the time. We thankfully elected, as a result, I believe, of this whole argument a new environmentally minded government that is in charge now and they are showing that they are more environmentally minded and um uh but I, it goes a long way to show how important it was that we all got together and uh banded together it wasn't just me i could not have pulled it off by myself thank god some really bright people who had many other very fine arguments against this thing, like the carrying capacity of the island. And uh, we were already at carrying capacity. It's in, in most people's opinion, we were full up, right up to here with um, the traffic. And it's gotten worse since then. Uh, it continues to get worse because our population keeps going up. And um, so traffic was a big one, carrying capacity, the carrying capacity of all of our tourism attractions, um, the, the, the much greater value of stayover tourism versus the cruise passengers. I mean, a tremendous difference in how much they're worth uh, daily to uh, our local economy and to all the hoteliers, and condo owners, et cetera, and uh, taxi drivers, and it goes on and on, uh, restaurants, uh, and all the, the gift shops people um but there were there was a small handful of uh big uh, gift shop type people uh owners of our biggest shops on the island little handful of those who would have benefited from this increase in uh, cruise tourism and uh so anyway thank god we all got together, including at least a couple of politically savvy folks 
who, you know, pulled me up because I, I was at a loss for how to deal with politics. And uh, thankfully, we, we angled in on voters and uh, who, and we made it quite aware uh, to our, our politicians of the time that the voters are greatly leaning in toward environmental conservation in all aspects of environmental conservation, not just underwater, but on, the, the, on land as well. And um, but we were able to stop that thing. Um, it was a huge effort. We had to actually take it to referendum. And it was only after we proved that we had the numbers to trigger a people's initiated referendum, which is much more difficult than a government initiated referendum. And uh, at that point, finally, government gave up. But they spent that government spent. I think it was something like three million dollars of our money fighting against us with paid advertising that largely was telling many different faceted lies about uh, how safe this was going to be for the reef and how good it was going to be for the economy and how it wasn't going to make any ne negative detrimental effect. So um, remember when they, was uh, they good tried for you? really hard. But they couldn't convince the population, yep. thankfully. Yep. And as a result now, we have a government. Yep. So remember when they told us that smoking was good for you? <laughs> yeah, right. You're one of the few people that I could say that to that would remember that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and Now I, we see where the lies were there. Yeah. So I want to uh, paint a, a little bit of a picture because it's something that we, that Marwan and I talk about frequently. So let's let's kind of take this that they were they were putting this pier in to bring larger ships in to bring more tourism in, and in the process killing the very things that the tourists were coming to the Cayman Islands, the Cayman, Grand Cayman for. Yeah, it was even worse than what you just said. Sound. Yeah. It was even worse than that because they were going to kill the only reefs on the island that are shallow enough in calm water for glass bottom boat tours. Right. And, and so would see that a was a dredge. large part of what cruise, yeah. large part of what cruise passengers wanted. The other thing that was going to be destroyed was access from shore to beautiful shallow reefs. They could snorkel to, they could walk from the cruise uh, dock over to the entry area for these different shore dives right in that immediate vicinity in Georgetown Harbor where the best of our shallow reefs are in calm water. When I say calm, I'm talking swimming pool calm, okay? That's the lee end of the island. And they were going to kill that super precious reef. And I've got to tell you, too, you could easily estimate the age of these reefs to be at least 5,000 years old in their development. These reefs uh, grew, grew from 35 feet deep at the, the deep edge in the sand that they rise up out of, up to within eight feet of the surface. And corals that build that reef, that, that kind of structure, those corals grow at a rate of approximately one quarter of one inch in diameter per year. A quarter of an inch in diameter per year. Whoa. That took a long time to grow those reefs, and they were going to kill them. <laughs> and it, I mean, that's, yeah. it's just sickening, you know? Yeah, so basically, and this is something that Marwan and I discuss frequently, is that our unchecked capitalistic impulses in the, globally end up killing the very base that supports them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, the influx in stayover tourism can be attributed to Bob Soto, who um, started the dive industry in Grand Cayman the year I was born. So 1957, Bob had this crazy idea to buy some scuba tanks put them on his, his boat, and begin taking uh, tourists out diving on the reef. And that attracted this rapid influx of stayover tourism to the island 
as we became world renowned as the diving mecca, all divers needed to go to Grand Cayman to go see this amazing reef we had. And all these fish, big fish and big friendly fish like the Nassau grouper, which it seems instinctively is extremely curious about scuba divers and friendly as a puppy dog. They, when a group of, say, 30 divers exit from a dive boat and start diving on the reef, at, when we used to have them, we don't have them on the West End anymore. But when I started here uh, in 83, uh, every dive site had dozens of Nassau groupers. And as you cross down across the reef, one after another, these big three-foot-long fish would swim right up and look you right in the mask and uh, greet you. Now, that's a photo op. And I'm here to tell you that if I was in charge of the Department of Tourism in Grand Cayman, I would be doing everything in my power to increase the number of photo opportunities because of today's social media. That is free advertising with all these divers with GoPros and pro cameras, et cetera, uh, looking for something to photograph. If you had a three foot long grouper looking at every diver over and over again, you would be the most famous dive destination in the Caribbean because everybody else in the Caribbean, just like us, has overfished their reef. But Bonaire is a shining example down in the Southern Caribbean in the ABC Islands of what an early response to this threat with a marine park can do for you. Uh, they were uh, early uh, in establishing their marine park, and they, they made a stronger marine park than ours. We started in 1986, and we failed to make that a real marine park. And as a result, um, Bonaire has an edge over us for dive tourism in respect of uh, you know the fish population and these photo opportunities on the reef. But we can restore this. It's not yet... Um, impossible for us to back off, take our hands off the reef, educate our population, which is kind of the end of uh, the punchline that I want to get to in the end here, is that I'd really like to be um, spending my time going to school, uh, educating children on the need, regardless what the regulations are, to just stop catching fish off the reef. Because uh, kids are handed a fishing rod like you and I were as kids, uh, and with no instruction, uh, even though there are fishing regulations here now, they're being handed fishing rods and, and they're not being told that you're not allowed to keep anything under eight inches, which is one of the regulations. I want to go around, teach the, all the kids about the regulations, but also if you don't have to catch a fish in order to eat dinner tonight, then don't. You know, if you don't have to buy a fish, a reef fish from the local fish seller, um, if you could afford to buy chicken or anything else, then buy chicken or anything else, because we desperately need to restore this population for so many reasons I could get into, but let's not get too deep in the woods. Sure. Courtney, is there a way to reintroduce those fish back into the reef? That's an excellent question because I've heard it so many times and it just makes me cringe <laughs> <laughs> because it is so simple to restore the population just by taking your hands off. Just stop catching them. They will rebound on their own. Really? But this idea the ones that, that are still there. a few not very well, you know, marine biology oriented people get um, because the fish we're talking about will live 20 to 30 years, maybe more. They don't reach maturity for about eight years. And so if you try to raise them in an aqua uh, culture situation, like a, some kind of a, a fish farm, to do that would be prohibitively expensive. It'd be ridiculously expensive. It's also environmentally detrimental, as we know from fish farms or from shrimp farms and fish farms elsewhere. The effluent from that is uh, terrible on the environment. But it's just such an easy fix. There's no money involved except for funding for marine research, counting your fish and paying attention to their uh, recovery, 
right? Alpha recovery. Learn how quickly they reproduce. So you get some idea uh, wh- how many you can possibly take per year and remain sustainable, allowing that uh, population to continue to grow without having it drop. And this is, can I, can I give you an analogy with banking? I, I don't want to take too long, but yeah. um, banking is a great analogy because let's say you have $10 million in the bank. And let's say that was our fish population, 1960. $10 million in the bank, earning 2% interest per year, you could safely spend 200000 per year and never cut into the principal. Now, anybody who understands their bank account can see how that works. You can stay a millionaire. $10 million in the bank as your principal, just consuming the interest earned each year, not more. As soon as you start digging into the principal now, you're dropping. And that's what we did heedlessly for decades, for 40 years, without uh, any thought whatsoever to what would be sustainable here. We just kept eating it away, eating it away, eating it away, uh, until finally somebody woke up and said, whoa, wait a minute, there's there's not enough fish left. And in 2003, we finally uh, closed the spawning grounds, but it was too late for Grand came in. And uh, we are not recovering quickly here at all, if we're recovering at all. However, we may be. Um, at least our fish expert at Department of Environment believes that there is some little sign of an increase in juvenile Nassau groupers in the lagoons. That's a good sign. However, we need to protect them. And there's a number of different ways to protect them that we have not yet um, initiated. And in the meantime, education of the problem could convince many people who otherwise would go out fishing not to. And that's my, my goal now. Uh, while I wait for the um, regulations to catch up to what I believe we need, and I believe are easy regulations to, to put into place, uh, but that's a whole other issue. I'd like to be teaching everyone here to just stop eating a reef fish until they recover. Give them a chance. Uh, did I answer the question, I think? Yeah, you did. So let's say they were able to, folks backed off. How long would it take to, to replenish to a healthy um, a level? Yeah, well, that is exactly the kind of research we don't have. So we don't know how long it would take. But we do know a few facts. We know that it takes them about eight years to mature, to become, you know, uh, capable of even producing eggs, and that the older they get, the bigger they get. They never stop growing. And the, the bigger they get, the more eggs they produce. The most important, the most valuable fish on the reef are the biggest ones. And they're the first ones you go to spear or try to catch and get all excited about catching and you keep them if you can until we set new regulations and finally just recently uh, we have done just that we now have a window for Nassau grouper but only Nassau grouper all the fish need this but for Nassau grouper we have a window you can take fish that are above a certain size and below a certain size but you cannot keep fish below that minimum or above that maximum size, because that maximum size is what we really need. We really need a lot of those to reproduce and uh, bring back the population that was here before we started fishing this reef. And I believe, because of the little bit of marine biology that I do know, uh, because I did major in marine biology for a number of years before finishing my BS degree in physical education, um, I know that um, you know, the more the more fish you have on the reef, the more they can produce, and uh, the more you can take sustainably each year. And this is really the target, I believe. And yet, the Department of Environment doesn't talk that way. They don't talk about um, restoring the old population of the reef uh, as it once was. They talk about just saving it from total wipeout. And we're just trying 
right now just trying to keep from wiping it right off the, uh, the island and maybe a very slow recovery. And how fast we recover really depends a lot in large part on how seriously we make an effort to stop fishing the reef. Yeah. So this is a discussion. In the face of this growing population. Yeah. And this right? is a discussion we have frequently here. Um, people around here talk about sustainability and I said, you want to target sustainability. That means to just sustain where you are now. Your target should really be resilience, which starts at sustainability and builds up and you're in the same position. They're talking about yeah. trying to sustain where you are now and what you need to be is resilient, which means you need to grow the populations. That's right. Oh, and uh, let me just backtrack a little bit. Another big facet of this whole thing is that, the reef itself has died a, a great deal, um, not completely. Thank God we still have some corals left, some hard corals left. But when I got here, the, the coverage of the reef in live hard coral was about 80%. So about 80% of the whole reef, that, that counts all the sponges and gorgonians in between, was live hard coral. Today, it's less than 20%. Uh, it's, it's been dropping so rapidly, it's probably down around 15% now, around on average, around the island. To take a quick step backwards, uh, for the people listening, coral is a yeah. living organism. And for those of you do, who don't know that, coral is a living organism that grows and it forms the reef, and the shells of them as they, they grow and die form the reefs. So if they're dying, there's no more reef, no more healthy reef. Sponges are also living. And, and so you have to understand that everything he's talking about is part of a living ecosystem. Yes. And we could talk uh, infinitum on that one because yeah. uh, it, it's also what built this island. The entire island is coral. Uh, it's, it's limestone built by coral reef animals. Um, but um, as the reef is dying, our scientists are very concerned that the source of sand is now absent, right? And not only that, the fish that used to convert the coral into sand are absent. So the big, they, locally they call them squab, but the big uh, parrotfish, there's three species of really big parrotfish here that are crucial in producing over 80% of all new sand on islands like ours. And that too is recent um, evidence from a study done in the Maldives on an island like this, where they proved that over 80% of all new sand on that island was being produced by the large parrotfish there. Which are game so fish. It, it, yeah, and here we ate them. Yeah. Um, there, there's, Hawaii too. There's so few. There are so few of those big ones left compared to what there once was mm -hmm. that it would behoove us to really take it seriously and protect the big parrotfish at least. And we are making moves in that direction. You can't spear them anymore. Uh, you can't spear the groupers anymore. At least the Nassau groupers, you can't spear them anymore. And uh, we've limited spear guns to people with licenses. Uh, you know, Department of Environment would really like to, and so would I, love to see spear guns completely um, gone because as you know, I grew up spearfishing in California. I know how detrimental that is, not only to a healthy population of fish, but, but certainly to a recovering population of fish. Yeah. And, so and that's just, just one, one issue. There's many, many other issues on yeah. how we could uh, restore the population. Um, but a catch limit would be a good start. We have no catch limit on how many fish anybody can take. We also allow anybody who lives here to catch fish or anybody visiting to catch fish from our reef. And we could stop that very simply. There's a very simple regulation that would uh, allow fishing uh, on the reef by Caymanians only, by, you know, people who are uh, Caymanians. Yep. Um, that would go a long way in reducing our take from the reef. Yeah. So we're, we're over our hour and I want to, uh, I want to ask if you'll come on again uh, in a couple of months so we can continue the conversation because it's a fascinating conversation. We never even got to, our starfish and your uh, sea anemones or your sea urchins uh, and, sea and the sea urchins yeah. and what's going on. That's a whole conversation into itself. Um, 
but I also, when we never even talked about some of our diving experiences, but I will tell you one thing is my, from my experience, I lived in Hawaii for a year and I was couch surfing with Hawaiians and diving with Hawaiians. And for all the diving and crazy stuff that we did, diving with Hawaiians is a whole nother extreme level of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I got right, one, uh, they, they, they gave me a Hawaiian sling with a three prong Hawaiian sling and pointed at uh, something in the reef. And I went down and looked at it. It was a 14 foot moray eel. I came back up to the top <laughs> and said, you want me to spear a 14 foot moray eel with this? Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. They, they have a whole nother level of crazy in Hawaii. Yeah. So. Well, I admire I'm, just, them. I'm just so sad. Huh? I am so sad now. When I go diving on our reefs now, uh, it just makes me sad yeah. uh, to see the change that's happened here. And I know that despite climate change and global warming and that the damage that that's doing to the corals, uh, because there's a, a perfect storm of things attacking our reef, not just our fish population, et cetera. Um, but there's, uh, we can go on for, for this. And I'm sure that by the time you edit this thing, uh, it's going to be less than an hour <laughs> because we had so many big glitches in this. Yeah. So thank you for the patience for all those people who did listen in on this uh, yeah. live. And I, I hope that we'll see a much, uh, much refined version of this uh, recorded when we get yeah. done. So um, well, yeah, I look forward we'll to that. And I look forward beginning. to the next talk. Yeah, it will cut out yeah. a little bit of the beginning. And now that we know how the tech stuff is, I'll just call you on my phone and we'll do it that way. Very good. Okay. Well, Mark, it was great seeing you. Yeah. So I, I have one question for you from our past. Yeah. Do you, do you remember us going to the drive-in theater in your old station wagon to see Legend of Hell House? Whoa. Yeah. That was scary. Yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, that was not yeah. a diving. That was not a diving story. But the, 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 well, well, yes. Uh, but no, it's, it was, um, we went to the drive-in and Courtney grabbed my knee at one point because he thought it would be funny. And I completely. Oh yeah, that was good. That was good. That's my favorite gag. Yeah. I love doing that. So yeah. And I but still maintain height, that's the, the best version of Hell House. Yep. Everybody should do that to their buddies. Yep. All right then. So, and, um, and I know you're doing, right. you've got you're you're in the afternoon, so uh, you've got some stuff to do, and we have a few things to wrap up. But yeah, I'd like to schedule some more time with you, if Marwan's okay with that. Oh, absolutely. That's fabulous. Cool. Yeah, and I'll bring yeah, the I pictures would, out would, next time. All right. Thank you All much. Right. All right. Talk Thanks to you soon, this, Mark. All right. All right. You too. Uh, All right. Bye, bye now. Bye. guys want to uh, bring me a mic up there so I can talk with Mark. So that that was a definitely a fascinating conversation there. Uh, definitely need to definitely. Oh, I'm sorry, what? He just needs to kill the line there. Oh. So that we can um, you know, hear everything yeah. and get into the, the wreath and the, what were you saying? The, the, the starfish and the, yeah. and the starfish. So definitely interested in that. And then just how the fact that global things came in islands, thousands of miles away, wherever it is. It's uh, in the Caribbean. A thousand miles away? Uh, three and a half thousand so it's miles. It's off the East Coast, right? Yeah, three and a half thousand miles. And how that affects us here. And we're looking at it, right? I mean, we've got Port Orchard is flooded. We've got ice storms. We've got, you know, over no, 50 deaths in the yeah, United States. There's no starfish here. There's no, there's no starfish here? There have not been starfish in, in uh, the West, most of the West Coast for over really? uh, eight years. A parasite, wow. this is why we want to talk about the sea urchins and Cayman Islands. Same thing happened. A parasite came in and wiped out the population Eight years later, it was starting to come back, and it's now almost eight years with the starfish. And then another parasite came in as wiping them out again. And they are a very important part of the ecosystem. They do very important jobs. The starfish eat shellfish. They keep their predator of the shellfish, so they keep things in balance. And the entire population of starfish dissolved 
really? like eight years ago from a parasite. They just like melted away and they haven't come back. So that, so our, the question is, are starfish like bees, right? So supposedly if we lose the bees, yeah, in, 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 in the, in the ecosystem, <laughs> and I am sure there are people that really like the fact that the shellfish populations are doing better because the starfish aren't there to eat them and keep them in check, but there is a very important balance and we have to look at the entire picture. It's what we talk about every Wednesday is that we have to look at the entire picture, not little pieces of it. And we have to look at it and understand how what we do here affects something over here right. because everything is connected. It's an ecosystem, it's a resilient ecosystems. We need to create resilient ecosystems in our humanity, in our oceans, on our lands. Otherwise, we won't be here. It's just that simple. You know, look at other people's problems, even though it does affect us indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, it seems so easy just to say, hey, look, don't fish. It's just illegal. Can't fish. You can look at them all day long. You just can't kill them. You can't but, fish them. But there's dollars involved. They're in there. Okay. Cayman has two major industries. They have banking, mm -hmm. obviously, and they have tourism. <clears throat> Both of those are intensive on other people coming to your island. But the thing about tourism is and wealthy people want what they, they want and they have the money to spend down there. But with tourism, if what they come there to see goes away, mm -hmm. you lose your tourism industry. That's why it seems so obvious. It's like, look. Well, it's obvious to us, but it, our, our paycheck isn't on the line. Wow. Wow. I used the term during our discussion, unchecked capitalism. And this is what I meant. Unchecked capitalism is not a good thing. It means we use our resources much faster than we can replace them. And at some point, that all collapses. And it's coming soon. Mm -hmm. to, to a life near you. We're going to have to do something, right? It's kind of we like me on the screen right now, just kind of fading in and out. Yeah. Like I'm not going to exist. You may be able to zoom in on me. Or, yeah. <laughs> You're ghosting, dude. You're ghosting. You well, I mean, it's you a, gray. <laughs> I think it's, it's a great example of what's happening. Yeah. You know? Is uh, yeah, this is a fascinating conversation. I'm glad that you, uh, you know, had someone to, to have this conversation and make it happen. So we'll have to definitely do this and, and have the pictures. I think will be great. Maybe yeah. you do it from your house that way you've got your computers, you could just share your screen, yeah, and then and just can, show those things. And then and, he can talk about it because a lot of the pictures he sent me and um, they were in Dropbox. My computer automatically just went there because mm -hmm. I have Dropbox there. My tablet's giving me all kinds of hell about it problems um but there are pictures of the presentation that was done on grand cayman about the environment and the reef where there were literally thousands of people supporting and, and participating now they have a population of eighty thousand people mm -hmm. so when five thousand people sign something that is a significant portion of the of the of the population yeah. and the new premier was in the audience around the edges watching to see that there was support for this and then he threw his hat in the ring to run for premier and really? won. Wow. Okay. And Courtney is as as is as non-political as you get. And he and I have been talking about this for a while, and he's been kind of interested in what we're doing. But when you know he, he thinks that at some point you have to get the grassroots movement going to to change politics, and then five years later, after he was going, I don't know if I could do that. And suddenly he's involved in getting <laughs> the new premier elected. Well, you can hear his passion. Yeah. So how long has he been in the Caymans? Uh, since 83, well, he said 86, but his uh, profile says 83. Wow. So, and I think he was there in 83. Uh, say he drove a submarine to do tourism, take tourists down. Uh, they have these glass submarines, all windows. And you take people down and you're like at 30 feet, cruising through the reef and looking at the fish and stuff. <clears throat> do you have like a, an emergency scuba tank? I would assume. Um, I, w I, I am in love with submarines. Matter of fact, no. Yeah, 30 feet, you don't even get bends. You just sort of swim to the surface. Mm. It's one atmosphere. So it's, it's, it's simple. Um, so kind of going back on my own personal history here, when I went into high school, um, <laughs> my, my, 
my world history teacher gave us an assignment for a final project. He says, you can do anything you want to do on your final project, as long as you do it in a historical and a world uh, picture. I did undersea exploration. And the end of that, and Courtney was in my class. Uh, in the end of that, um, we went to um, the beach and I had built an undersea city uh, out of models. And I put it out about 20 feet, 30 feet out and took people out to look at it in the eel grass. It's gotten part of it. But one of the things I talked about was Trust Day 2, which was a deep submersible, one of the first ones to go deep into the uh, Mariana's Trench. Now, I come up here, you know, many, 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 many years later, uh, around 2000, 2001, and we go to the Keyport Undersea Museum. Mm -hmm. And Trust Day 3 is sitting right there in the parking lot. Really? And I'm like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> And I'm like completely mind blown, thrown back into high school and thinking about, oh my God, I would have, I would have given a kidney to have gone down in a deep sea submersible. Wow. Now where's the trench at? Huh? Where's that trench? Oh, Mariana's Trench. Mm -hmm. um, it's on the Pacific Ocean, closer to the Marianas Islands. Um, and it is the deepest trench on the planet. It goes over a mile deep. How close is it to like off the coast of California? Oh, it's thousands of miles, oh, okay. 2,000 miles away. It's between California and Australia to kind of give perspective. Okay. Just want to make sure because that's where all the big super creatures are, right? Yeah. And we didn't even get to talk about, huh? Kaiju, <laughs> uh, the giant squid, yeah. you know. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I want that, that trench to be very far so, away. We haven't explored hardly, you know, just a very small percentage of our oceans. Yeah, but we're, busy, terrifying. But we're busy killing it by the time we get to explore <laughs> it. There won't be anything left. Yeah. Well, right. Except for the big stuff that really kills you, you know. <laughs> so Courtney and I were diving in. Uh, we went on a, um, a dive boat to Catalina Island, from which is about 26 miles um west of San Pedro in California, which is not too far from where we lived an hour away. And we were diving on about 35 feet of water. And we came to a um, kind of a split where there were like two canyons and a fork. And he went down the uh, right one. I went down the left one. And suddenly we're about 20 feet down the, the canyon and we're looking for abalone and, and stuff. And suddenly everything gets silent and there are no fish anywhere mm. and yeah, i know that you don't think of noise in the water i didn't think about noise in water until there was none and then you think about it a lot you think about oh god what's going on so i start coming back down the 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 the, the staying on the bottom coming back down the reef and i'm like pull myself around just as courtney's pulling himself around <laughs> and we see each other about this far apart with our mask hug <laughs> Oh, wow. And then we kind of like, and so we swim along the bottom and we get to the anchor of the boat and we're like, uh, we're 35. Okay. And then we shoot, shoot straight up and onto the dive deck, throw our tanks and water off just as the captain hit the recall button for divers, mm. calling everybody back to the boat. And uh, people's heads were popping up out of the water all around. And Courtney and I are looking going, uh, yeah, no. Um, Apparently, uh, no, not apparently, what was happening very close to where we were was a great white shark was caught by a trawler. And it's the one that is the skeleton at SeaWorld. And that happened when we were in the water with it. Uh, no, but I'm pretty sure there was a, by the time when I saw Courtney, I'm pretty sure there was a trail of yellow following me back along the bottom. Wow. <laughs> so is that, was that the tequila? Is that why it went <laughs> silent? <laughs> yeah, no, it was, uh, there was a fish deterrent. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that was, that was one of the stories that we had. And um, there, and, and Courtney, you know, as I was telling the Hawaiians, are fearless. They, they hunt boars with knives and dogs. These guys do things that just make no, I mean, I, I guess it's cool, but makes no sense to me. I mean, you know, I've got a gun, I'm going to use it, <laughs> but you know, um, and Hawaiians have a whole different level, but Courtney was my first experience with somebody who has no fear. Mm. 
about stuff. He, I watched him one time while we were diving off Laguna Beach, pull a octopus out of a, a hole and let it wrap around his head with a, the beak on its on his face mask. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, not happening. Yeah, no, no. I don't really want to go in the water. Oh, you know, mostly it's really cool. I, I, I love diving. Um, free diving is one of my favorite things on earth. Just when you put this, he, he's right. Uh, actually, you weren't there for that story. But um, when you have tanks and all, weights and all the stuff on, it makes movement restrictive. I love just poof, straight into the water and just swimming. And just, you know, I want mass snorkel fins. That's it. On the other hand, the one time I did that in Catalina and I was like whipping along the, the reef, um, I was coming right up the reef and suddenly I saw this fin go like this and I pulled way, way back as I was coming up off the reef and there's a fish called a rock sculpin. They're about this big. For those people who haven't seen this, it's about uh, 18 inches to two feet. And their spines are neurotoxins. <laughs> And my chest was about that far away from the spines as I pulled away from it. And it was just sitting there on the rock. Yeah, you're not saying any good stories on why to go down into the water. Um, the beauty of it. The, the, the beauty of it. I mean, we always tell the exciting stuff. I can see that at Petco. Yeah. But it's. Actually, you would love, you would like Anama Bay. Anama Bay in Hawaii is an enclosed bay. The reef keeps all the big things out. And there's a lot of little fish in there that are really colorful and they give you peas to feed them. Really? Nothing scary in there? Nothing scary. Little okay. uh, frozen peas. No, since last year, there, were, there are eels in there because I've been in that bay. Oh, okay. Well, none of them ever bothered. Did they bother you? Well, yeah, that, that, okay, mm. don't stick your hand in holes. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, I've, I you know, wanted a more exciting story. I went after an abalone, and I didn't see the eel in the cave, and I lost my best dive knife. Wait, what's an abalone? Abalone is a shellfish about this big. Well, if you're doing it right, it's this big. And if you peel them off, it's all muscle inside that sucks it onto the rock. Mm-hmm. And you, uh, if you get them out, you peel them out of their shell. You've seen an abalone shell, right? Uh, they're really colorful mother of pearl inside, and they're rough on the outside, usually no. about four holes on the side. Mm -mm. Okay. They're gorgeous. That's um, the first time I heard the word. Yeah, uh, but you pull the abalone out, and you beat the bloody hell out of it with a mallet, and you bread it, you fry it. It's one of the best things on earth. Abalone. Yeah. Yeah, never heard of it. They're all fished out. You can't get it anymore. Oh, well, that might be why I never heard of it. Yeah. I watched people pull 12, 14, 15 of them out uh, of the rocks and, and go take them home. And you're only allowed to get five. Mm. And you have to make sure they're a certain size. I was laughing when Courtney was saying, yeah, you have to make sure it's, uh, the, 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 the fish is within this window. And I was going to ask him, says, okay, you and I have been spearfishing, Courtney. How easy is it to measure, pull out your ruler and measure the fish? <laughs> <laughs> Let me take out my 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 tape measure. <laughs> yeah, but does it have an app for deep sea water? <laughs> the app goes. Uh, it's fascinating, but yeah, it's. I I would like to scuba once, but I do want to just do it in the safe. Anama Bay is fun. I you know I'm afraid I'm I am terrified to go back to Hawaii because I. I lived in Hawaii for a year and couch surfed and I have been there many times in the seventies and early eighties. And I hear what's happened to it. Uh, and with the over, over the, the over development of there. And I've heard that uh, Waimea falls has dried up a good chunk of the year now. And I just kind of don't want to go back and have my, my memories meet reality. Yeah, I can see in the pictures. You see in the pictures the locales and everything. Mm. The reefs are dying. Um, Oahu's horrible, from what I hear. 
Um, Maui, I don't know what that's like. I hear the, the, if I was going to go there, I'd go to Hilo. I go to the big Island because it's the only one that's still reasonably pristine. I mean, there's, there's, uh, Kauai and Molokai and some of the other, uh, Lanai, some of the other islands that aren't as populated and they put protections on for that, but I won't, I don't want to spend any time on Oahu again. There's a place called the seven sacred pools and there's a pool with these like running falls down it. And over the top of the uh, the pools are guava trees. And I would walk down and pull a guava off, and from one pool to the other, I would eat the guava. Uh, gu- guavas are sweet and tangy. And I would eat the guavas going down, the, the going, walking from pool to the other. It is, it, Hawaii truly defined paradise for me. Mm. I love that. And, you know, <laughs> we went to a restaurant in Oahu, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell the punchline of the story in a second, but uh, my friend Bruce and I, I was living with his family because he's Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian Filipino. And I was living with his family as we were couch surfing in different islands. And uh, we had just enough money left before we were heading back to go to a fancy restaurant in Oahu. So we went to uh, uh, Honolulu and we went to this restaurant and I ordered steak. He ordered lobster and a cockroach flew in and landed on the steak. And I took my knife and pinned it. Dinner was free that night. <laughs> Did you eat the steak? Not, well, the next one, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So cockroaches in Hawaii are about this yeah, they big. get really big. You know what? I, I heard that. So I spent three weeks in Hawaii, and I was told that before I went, and so I was terrified. And well, spiders so, and something else well, down there the, too. The, right? the frogs, which are which yeah. you don't think about. Uh, we were driving back from that night on the King's Highway, heading back to where we were staying in Haleiwa, which was on the, the North Shore. And we were driving back from Honolulu, and suddenly we were sideways on the road, sliding, mm. and pulled over to the side and going, what the hell was that? We get out, and there's like a million frogs pouring across the road, and we just drove oh, through wow. them. wow. You know, I didn't see any when I was there. I yeah. was I was so thankful. So, they were like, oh, yeah, you go into a jewelry yeah. store, and there's yeah. roaches and bugs in there. And well, I, I don't know if people were pulling see, my chain, but I didn't see anything. Oh, no, thank God. They're there. And they yeah, were like, they put do, your they, shoes they, upside they down. Do, they, and yeah. they, they eat a lot of things that, you know, I won't eat. Um, and it's not because of my allergies. It, I mean, they, they we went, I, I, we eat on the beach, quite honestly. Most of the time we walk out from the house and we go down to the beach and we would eat on the beach and they would bring blood beans, which is beans and pork uh, and pork blood. And I'm like going, yeah, no, <laughs> that's right off the list. Pork blood. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. I didn't, but there's they, Living in Hawaii was great, but the cockroaches and such, you don't really worry about. We were living on Lanai's, which are the the porch, uh, uh, the, the screen porches in in the uh, area. And um, you learn to love geckos because the, the, the geckos are, they're all over the place and, and they will, they will run over you, but they are so cool and so friendly and they eat the cockroaches. Oh, they're cool and friendly. They're great. They are. They're cool and friendly. Oh, I, I appreciate them eating the cockroaches. Yeah. But they're everywhere. That's the problem. Well, actually, in the five-star hotels, they, they, they tend to control them. Wow. Hey, I'm all I'm all about staying in the Lanai's. That was one of the coolest times in my life. Do they have spiders, too? Um, I never saw one. Mm. But I've heard that they do. And they have centipedes, too. Yeah, centipedes. They were like, yeah, keep your shoes upside down. Yeah, check your shoes. You know, you just do a standard thing. You check your shoes and make sure nothing's in them. I was terrified. Yeah, I grew up in the high desert. You I always do that anyhow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I never saw anything. It was great. Yeah, I grew up in the high desert, so we had tarantulas, scorpions, sidewinders. So you always checked your shoes. Wait, where were you? I grew up in the high desert. What, what? San Bernardino. Uh, down in California? Southern, Cal- Southern California. Okay, so don't go to Southern California. Check. <laughs> Got it. Oh, Or Texas. Uh, no, co- with the, kittens. The, the beat the beats and living the, with the kittens. Yes, I told you about that. We went to we stopped at the Blue Different Rest Area, and 
and they're, you know, they have to raise walkways because of the rattlesnakes and everything. And there's literally cameras being abandoned and living there. So they get the, 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 and I'm just like, they're food for the person. I'm, uh, shut up. The <laughs> rattlesnakes eat the kittens? Yeah. Don't make me come over there. I can't help it. <laughs> well, that's funny. <laughs> that's hilarious. So, so okay, so right off the bat, Australia, the entire continent, is off limits for my one. <laughs> Yo, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the entire continent of yeah. Australia. Yeah, you might as well just stick Yeah, no, I'll just Google it. But it, it is on my bucket list. There, there's some, uh, I like the architecture. Like, I want to go to Russia. I want to go to Australia. Go to um, New Zealand, because New Zealand has no snakes. No snakes? On the planet. The most poisonous critters on the planet, well, period. True. The platypus, this cute little weird duck thing, is got poisonous spines that'll kill your butt. Really? Marwan, you talk about life on hard mode. This is where most people go to survive. Like, we step into the normal game, mm -hmm. and we're like, we're going to stay normal. No monkey goes, give me Australia. Wow. Okay. I, didn't know, I didn't know platypus had uh... a. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna go right into the de the death march zone. Has anybody here heard of Snake Island? It, it's off of Argentina. It is the home of four or five species of the most poisonous snakes in the world. It is you, you are not allowed to go there at all because if you do, you will die. Wow! In a horrible way. No, what do they eat? Yeah, <laughs> anything that's running around there. I don't know. I mean, I was each other? I was, like, yeah. I mean, what else is there? I was, docu I was watching a documentary, Boot, Boot, all, Birds. But I mean, if there's that many, how can you, you know, at some point you'd figure they would just destroy it all. I'm just saying now. They wouldn't destroy it all. So, Gendry, you, you might not know, but I've spent a lot of my life studying biology. <laughs> So there's a lot of stuff that I'm very interested in that I that I learn about. Well, this took a turn. Yes. <laughs> but, no, but it didn't really because we're right back to the fact it's all it's all ecosystem. Everything needs something else. We just talked about the snakes. You need to have something for the snake seed. It's all balanced. And if we as humans do not pay attention to this. We are threatening the entire ecosystem, whether we think we are or not. And we need to be able, you know, huh? Well, it, it, this is the one place where market should control it. I mean, I go to Costco and I look at the halibut there. Not that I really want to buy Costco halibut. But I look at the halibut Costco and it's $32 a pound. I said, well, I guess I'm not buying halibut. Yeah, the salmon's pretty expensive. Salmon's delicious, but. Yeah, I buy the cod. Well, it's something you see you know that tilapia. It's something you see that <laughs> because um, you make it taste like anything. Well, tilapia has, you gotta be careful with that too, because it has um, that I, I'm not iodine, but something in it. Like, like someone told me, I'm just gonna be in wet. Yeah, and tilapia is pretty harmless fish for a white fish, but it's also pretty flavorless. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, if you grow, if we do the grow centers here, when we do the grow centers here, we can grow tilapia in aquaponics centers and have tilapia and have basically small tilapia farms all over the peninsula. Mm. Mm. And so by having the tilapia for people who don't necessarily like that fishy flavor, you can make it taste like anything. So we have to figure out how to grow. The, the, you know, Korean barbecue yeah. or doing the mm -hmm. yaki so mm -hmm. at the very base, at the very base of it, we have to make sure we have cattle so that we can have milk, so we can have butter. And we have to make sure that we, ha we can grow lemons, which is really challenging in our environment. And we have to grow dill because with lemon, dill and butter. Yep. Well, then we need crab. A, a need for it yeah. and so when when the quantity goes down the 
price goes up. So, so if we make it a sustainable, as long as food is sustainable, the price can't be. So here's a, here's a factoid for you. And back in the 60s, I watched a Jacques Cousteau special on crabs and, and seafood. And um, it turns out that crabs don't die of old age. They just shed their shell and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm thinking that somebody sometime is going to dive under the uh, under the ice in Alaska yeah, yeah. and come up with and, and come up with a king find a king crab that's like you know 50 feet across. <laughs> no, no, I'm not eating that. I've seen some YouTube videos of crabs whose legs are longer than the table, and it's like, yeah, I'm good. I, that's no, that's there's nothing cool about that. Order the crab, and it was cooked, it was clean, but it was the whole crab. And yeah. your plate was this big. Yeah, the place over in on the on the wharf in mm -hmm. in Seattle has does that too, the crab bucket or something like that. I actually oh, crab, crab pot. Crab yeah, crab, crab pot. pot. I go to the place yeah. outside of the crab pot where they have the smoke fish. Uh -huh. And when I go to Seattle, that's where I go to have lunch because you're not going to have any of my allergens in you know halibut or cod. Uh, that's been smoked with alderwood, which is fabulous. And they do quarter potatoes. And like, yeah, I'll have the quarter potatoes in that, and we're good. It's good. But the crab pot, you go in there. It's a very nice place, view of the water. And then, but you know, if you're going to do that, you should go to the aquarium and off to one side where they have that the transparent octopus thing that goes over the top. Off to the side, there's this little camera. And a little a little station that nobody ever mans, and you should go watch that for a few minutes because it's actually cameras that are about 160 feet down off the wharf because it's that deep. And there are times that sharks that are really freaking big, like bigger than boats, swim by there. And what they do is they throw uh, uh, bags of rotting food off there for the fish to eat and for the sharks to eat. Mm. Shark is tasty. Ugh. Shark is good. Oh, I've had some really delicious deep fried uh, shark. Shark is oily and, oh. and slightly gamey. Deep fried. Huh? So good. I haven't deep fried. Oh, one. man. But I, I, okay, so I lived in um, Huntington Beach, California. Turn the heat up. I'm freezing. Yeah, um, I lived in Huntington Beach, California, um, and when one of my first houses, and it was a, a little uh, beach shack converted into an apartment, and it was like a little, half studio, half one bedroom. And I didn't have a lot of money. So I went down to Huntington Beach Pier. There's a guy across the street named Larry who was really cool. And he let me use his poles. And uh, we went off to the pier and we would fish. And the Benita would run in. And Benita are, they're about two feet. And they're, they're fast. They're built like tuna. And smoked Benita to this day is still my favorite fish. Mm. And you can, they, they boil in and you take a diamond jig lure, no bait. And toss it in, and they will hit like that. And in like a half an hour, forty-five minutes, I'd have a, I'd hit limit, which is about eleven fish. Anita, huh? I don't think I've had that either. They're in the same family, but they're not quite in the same flavor range. Okay, so then I would take the, them to the Main Street Saloon, which doesn't exist anymore. Neither does the pier, actually. And I would trade them for eggs and milk, and then they would they would smoke some of it, and then I would get some of it. Back. I would get some of the smoked fish. So, um, and that's how I would live as I would trade fish and such, but you don't only ever get Benita. Sometimes you catch a shark and actually fairly frequently you'd catch a shark and he'd bring it on and you beat it to death <laughs> immediately. And you'd eat shark. And I don't particularly care for shark. I've eaten enough of it Good. in my life. Yeah. Deep fried. Just try it. Deep fried. It's delicious. But anyway, yeah, shark is an interesting thing. And it depends on what kind of shark you have as to how it tastes. Have you had eel? Yes. Is that good? Oh, unagi? One of my favorite things on earth. An augie? Unagi. unagi. It's, it's unagi. sushi. It's sushi. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it's freshwater eel with barbecue sauce on it. With barbecue sauce? Yeah. Oh. Good thing. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. 
anyway, yeah, there's there's all kinds of things. But, you know, my favorite fish is halibut. I, I, like I, halibut. I, I get halibut and I coat it with uh, ginger marmalade. And then I grill it. And it grills into it. And it's just like the ginger sweet flavor with the halibut is pure heaven. But I can't, yeah, but it has been so fished out that you can't get it anymore. Or if you do, it's it's like 32 bucks a pound. And so we fished out the, the Gulf of Alaska. Um, the Grand Banks have been fished out pretty much. So we're in a world of hurt. like you couldn't get cod for a while. Yeah. I grew up on cod. And then all of a sudden, I didn't see cod in the store for a long time. Yeah, and now they, they have this mystery fish called rockfish, which or could be whiting. any... Or That's an East Coast fish, yeah. whiting. Yeah, or like, any, any number of, of things that are like, what? <laughs> whiting is pretty good, though, because you can get it at all the corner stores. Yeah, actually, I've been meaning to go up to the Squamish Seafood uh, and take a look at what they got. Well, is everyone hungry now that we've been talking about food for the past 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> hey, lox bagels and cream cheese. Best of all worlds. Damn. I'm with him though on this one. That I am. Matter. I am so. I, I you know Jewish roots. I grew up with uh, with delicatessen food, and so to me, there. Okay, you know if if we were going to do a road trip, we should go down to Los Angeles and go to Cantor's. It's like the best Jewish delicatessen on the West Coast of the United States. And I, oh my God, one time I, I, I was coming back from Santa Barbara. We were going through Los Angeles, going back home. And I took a friend of mine to Cantor's. And I'm like, okay, I'll have uh, corned beef on rye with Swiss, bowl of matzo ball soup, and um, go from there. And the person I was with ordered turkey on white with mayo. Wow. And I'm like, It's just, like going to Hawaii and going to McDonald's. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Although they do have banana pies instead of apple pies, and the banana pie is delicious. But yeah, there is that. But we should we should do a road trip to Cantor's and you know. I haven't I haven't been to Disneyland. I've been to Disney World. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like we need to plan a train trip. Or have I? I've been to Knott's Berry Farm. Take the Cas uh, Cascade Starlight straight on down. Yeah, maybe. Get a car with this little side door so you can each of us have a bed and sleep through the night and stuff. I never want. Wow. But yeah. That'd be fun. Well, you want to give folks some uh, some thoughts as we go out of this year and into the new year? Yeah, folks, wake the hell up. Get off your butt. Meet your neighbors. And come talk to us about how to make the world a better place. Great. I was going to say it quite like that, but... Um... <laughs> Um, what what I was saying earlier, a few podcasts ago, is you do not have to wait for an arbitrary date to make a change. So it's close enough to the 1st of January that, hey, if you're going to make a change, okay, fine. But outside of that, you do not need to wait for a date. You learn something new and you want to make a change, you want to make a difference, just make the difference. Just start doing it. Uh, make the impact. We can't wait. You know, these there's so many different things um, that are in a at the tipping point, right? As the show is, is, is at a tipping point. We're at a precipice, and some things were, are lost. We're not going to be able to get them back. So whatever we can preserve, whatever we can save, we we have to be um, we have to have an urgent mindset about it. I think 2023 should be a mindset of urgency. We cannot slowly try to figure things out and learn and what should we do and whole hum we, we have to be urgent we have to be urgent uh so be urgent about something and be urgent about multiple things if you can if you have the capacity and many hands make light work uh so engage with other people as mark said and let's get urgent about saving ourselves absolutely and remember every year that passes and we're is one less year we have. Facts. Well, with that, I will say, 
please have a uh, safe New Year's. I don't know what the weather is going to bring us because <laughs> we don't know what's going on. It's crazy. Well, they say out like a lamb, in like a uh, lion like or a something lion. like that. I like a lion, in like a lamb, but in this case, it's yeah, the out like a lion, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is climate change is real, folks. Climate change is real. Ice storms. I mean, this is, we thought last year was crazy with uh, Texas getting their ice storm and people dying. And then this year, you know. Let's, let's, Mother Nature's like, hold my beer. Let's do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, here, hold my beer and watch this. So let's just take a real recap of the high and low. Mm -hmm. We had 110 degrees and 15 degrees. Yeah. Here Street's in Kitsap melting. County. Yeah. Yeah. This year. Yeah. And from what I understand, this summer is probably going to be really hot, seeing as it got so cold. Yeah. Every year is going to be hotter and colder. Mm. it's it's here we there's no way to stop it now what we can do is mitigate it and uh and cop 27 promise and promise and promise and then for those of you who didn't hear that <laughs> oh, i heard you clearly enough Thank you. <laughs> well all right y'all this is the last episode of tipping points and puzzle pieces for 2022 join us next year same bad time same bad channel and we will continue on the pursuit of resiliency. Yep. You got the final word there, Mark. Have a great new year. Then get off your butt and go meet your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. See you on the other side.